I'm going to ask um, each of the panellists to um, introduce themselves and say a few words because uh, they know themselves better than um, I do. And, and also just give a, a brief answer to the question, I suppose, um, that we must all ask every single day. Why are you here? Um, <laughs> what, what points would you like to raise and, and, and what is your, uh, your take on the central question of building the green economy and, and developing an industrial strategy uh, for the environmental sector, as we can see behind us. Uh, we've already heard from John, so we will start uh, from uh, next to John with, uh, with Paul. Thanks, James, and thanks for the opportunity just to, to say a few words about uh, the TUC's thinking on the green economy and what, what more businesses, you know, government, politicians, policymakers, and indeed trade unions can do to deliver sustainable growth. I mean, this is a, a hugely important agenda for the people that we represent and aspire uh, to represent. We've already heard a little bit about the, the political context. We've got a general election just uh, well, less than six months away. Uh, John talked about that UN climate change conference. And we think at the TUC this is a, a potentially a pivotal moment, really, and one which uh, requires a, a bold policy agenda and the political will to drive through that policy agenda. Because, uh, I mean, the TUC is very clear that we think there are huge, not just environmental benefits from this whole agenda, but potential economic benefits as well. And, and in the context of the people that we represent, real potential benefits in terms of high quality, sustainable jobs that are difficult to offshore, but also bringing real opportunities and real hope to communities that, that feel or are in danger of feeling left behind as the economy starts. Uh, to recover. So really, I thought I'd, I'd set out sort of three points, two which I think are being familiar and, and have been talked about a little bit, uh, but one maybe which is a, a unique TUC perspective, maybe answers James' existential question about where, why we're here. Excellent. Before we get into those three points, maybe if I just say a, a few words about the political context, because it obviously uh, is important, um, and particularly sort of the short term uh, political context. I mean, it's hard to believe back in. 2010, the coalition parties told us if you, if you mixed a little bit of conservative blue uh, and liberal democrat yellow, uh, you ended up with a green government and they boasted that this would be potentially the greenest uh, government ever. Unfortunately, um, I think that boast has proven to be uh, somewhat hollow over the course of the last four years. Not to say that there haven't been some good policies, some good intentions, but some real issues uh, we believe at the TUC around uh, implementation and a sense of real commitment and we saw just a few weeks ago the former Environment Secretary Owen Patterson talking about uh, uh, the potential for scrapping the Climate Change Act and I think that you know, in many ways tells uh, its own story but from the TUC's perspective whoever wins the next election and I'd echo all the points about political uncertainty we don't know what the outcome of that election will be uh, lots of parties in the mix and the impact of the SNP's vote in Scotland on Labour, UKIP uh, and so on but whoever wins that next election it's important that they put sustainable growth in the green economy we believe at the heart uh, of that next government and, and so the three points I want to make just very quickly uh, are this two of which is a, a familiar ones one we need that bold vision from government I think Matthew talked about uh, ambition but a real vision about what a dynamic green economy uh, would look like and then a route map to deliver that, that bold vision and the p policy certainty that, that John and Matthew both uh, spoke about the green economy is already worth over £120 billion uh, to support a million jobs. The TUC thinks there's a potential to do a lot, lot more. And a potential, uh, as I said before, in terms of creating good quality and sustaining good quality uh, jobs in rebalancing and renewing our manufacturing industries and regenerating our regions and bringing growth to those parts of the economy, as I said before, in danger of being left uh, behind. Second point, uh, I think, again, to, to match points that have already been made, I think it's important that we map, match that vision, that sort of ambition really, with a clear, intelligent, green industrial strategy. And John talked about the, the wax and wanes of, of industrial policy. I mean, I think it's very clear throughout 80, the 80s and 90s, industrial policy was very much out of vogue uh, under both Conservative and New Labour governments. Came slightly back into vogue in 2008 with the, uh, I propose, I mean, Gordon Brown announcing his retirement from frontline politics uh, today, but with that Brown government. Uh, and new industries, new jobs, Peter Mandelson at the then DTI. Uh, and it's fallen out of favour and then back in favour over the recent period. And we think it's absolutely important that politicians of all parties focus on that clear industrial strategy, linking up everything from you know, what the skills uh, that are going to be required for the new uh, economy, apprenticeships through intelligent procurement, investment in R&D, uh, and government investment in key uh, uh, industries and key projects. And I think the point's already been made. This is not about... Uh, picking winners uh, or big government, but it is about learning some of the examples from you know, other economies, successful economies, uh, and com economies that have uh, grasped this nettle from around 
uh, the world. Because I think while there's clearly a role for business to lead, what is also abundantly clear that this is not a set of issues that you can just simply rely on the market uh, to address. And there have been practical illustrations of that in the UK. John talked about one of the big ticket items in terms of carbon capture uh, and storage. It's a, a set of technologies that we've been supportive of at the TUC for a number of years, frustrated at the slow development uh, of CCS. But it's a very good example of a technology that has the potential not just to uh, deliver uh, green energy, but to sustain our chemical or other energy intensive uh, industries. And it's a technology that can't happen without government investment and support. And I think if you run that through in different areas uh, of investment, whether it's what we do with HS2, what we do with housing, thinking all the way through about that joined up industrial strategy uh, is important. Third final point, and, and maybe the reason why the TUC is here. I mean, this is a crucial policy debate, and it's one that we think that unions should be absolutely uh, at the heart of it, and at the heart of that debate for uh, a number of, of reasons. We've done a lot of work uh, in recent years, not just on CCS, but with our energy intensive industries, on green reps, union reps working with employers to think about how you make a positive difference at the level of individual workplaces. We've worked with the RDAs in the past and now with the LEPs to really think about green jobs, green industries uh, and skills. And we're absolutely clear that, I mean, actually, you, know, you need to put the voice of the workforce at the heart uh, of this debate. We represent people right across the economy, from automotive through to energy, people working in our universities uh, uh, and our colleges, people who bring together diverse range of skills in manufacturing and so on. And we want to bring the voices of those people working across those different sectors to this debate. And we also want to bring where we can our political weight to bear uh, in, in, the, in the policy debates that will be going uh, forward. Uh, we've just published, for example, this latest uh, report which sets out where we think uh, the scope for more innovation in the economy and developing a low carbon uh, future and we're very we're very clear that the future of the industrial policy of the green economy is very much linked to the future of the jobs of the people that we represent uh, and aspire uh, to represent so i think my final point uh, james would be please see trade unions as a partner in this agenda involve us challenge us bring us on board in this debate as we move forward because we think that the people that we represent have got a huge amount to offer uh, in this debate moving forward. It's a key point that we go into this week. I, I think I tweeted yesterday that there's a huge debate on how we uh, create high paying jobs, how we get tax receipts up, how we improve uh, GDP and continue to get sustainable growth. And there'll be the massive debate tomorrow on it. And the green economy does deal with all of those and it's hardly ever uh, spoken about in that context from the front benches. Julia, uh, next up, uh, if you could maybe introduce yourself and give a bit of context to uh, Trillium Fund. Hi, so um, I'm Julia Groves and I'm CEO of a business called Trillium. Um, and Trillium exists to get as many people as possible to have a stake, however small, in a green economy and a more sustainable future. Um, I'm also chair of the Crowdfunding Association and want to talk by talking a little bit just about people and about money. I'm really encouraged to hear conversations about demand and how important demand is rather than focusing on supply. Um, and I'm very comfortable with that phrase, green economy. And I think we should almost never use the word green without economy beside it. And that would be the way forward. Um, so we're sitting on something of a revolution in banking. Uh, and I will work my way back to green, don't panic. But we did 1.74 billion in the UK last year through these little alternative finance platforms, and that's predicted to rise to 4.4 billion this year. It's starting to get big enough that the banks are taking note, and some might even argue are retaliating in areas. But there's a huge innovation coming through in the UK, well ahead of the US for once in our lives. I think the Facebook of finance will be a bridge. And Osborne and others are massively behind it because there's a two-sided opportunity here. An opportunity to get access to finance for the SMEs, which are the absolute solution to economic recovery in the UK, and an opportunity for normal, everyday investors like me to make a decent return on the money at the same time. Now, how this plays out in the green space is really, really key because most of the changes we're talking about doing are going to take more than one political cycle to achieve. You know, four years in three, two and a half years in practice is a short period of time. And most of the changes require a capital investment which break existing business models. So how do we find a way to make green economy issues a vote winner in that situation? How do we popularise this? How do we counteract some of the negative noise out there about these, this green crap and these taxes which are costing us so much money and help people think longer term. We don't expect much, to be honest, from the utility company's point of view, but we do see, I agree with John, 
long-term commitment from businesses who are genuinely recognising there's a commercial opportunity here for those who are able to think beyond that quarter results. And so we think that people being the backers and the investors in these businesses has an extraordinary effect. The reaction to shale, for example, in the UK is not just a hysterical one around water contamination and not in my backyard. It's this constant attitude that these things are being done to us. It's the disconnection between people and politicians. And I increasingly see things quoted and said by the politicians who I have the joy of spending a lot of time with these days, which bears no relation to the general public's views. And yet here we are in manifesto seasons going into an election and we have got this opportunity or this challenge to connect the people with the politicians by connecting people with their money. So we think that there is a real chance using the renewable energy sector to decentralise, to introduce some competition, because competition is the only way we're going to get energy prices under control. Shale is not going to be the answer. Competition, in my view, is. And to allow people to make a little bit of a profit by making a difference. But where this all becomes very powerful, whether it's renewable energy, energy efficiency, transport, is when people think they are doing this and driving it themselves and it's not being done to them. And where the result is a fair economic outcome for all of those who put some skin in the game and take some risk. So we believe that we can find a way to encourage huge numbers of individuals to move a little bit of their money out of bank accounts. There's 1.12 trillion pounds in bank accounts and in cash ISAs learning, earning less than the rate of inflation. There are 5.5 million people in the UK who now don't have a financial advisor but do have savings and investments. And I think there's appetite there for appropriate investments which where they will invest alongside the brands and the corporates to make a decent return and move us towards more of a green economy. Feed-in tariffs is a classic example of that. The planning constraints that you talk about, energy efficiency being the area. How you make energy efficiency sexy is kind of my challenge for 2015. Um, but the logic for me is where the people who are investing in the lagging, not just the LEDs, and, and, and the moves needed in a large building like a hospital to make it energy efficient, are also the ones who profit from the returns, kind of de-risks the investment from that point of view. So the key challenges, I think, are to try and popularise this to help people feel that it's normal to actually think about a green economy rather than that being a slightly freaky thing to do, to give people visibility of others doing it at the same time. And there's a huge role for businesses to see their consumers actually as co-investors in what they're doing. The days of spending money in CSR are almost gone. If you want to do corporate social responsibility, just get on with your own agenda and allow customers the opportunity to come with you and invest alongside and to benefit as they go through. So I think what we're seeing is a revolution in finance, which will really help drive a revolution in the energy markets. The parallels are there the whole way through. And when we're talking about business, we're talking about consumers, and we're talking about politicians and policy, we're talking about people who work for us. So let's put the consumers at the heart of what we're doing. The handy reminder that I imagine every single person here probably has a tiny chunk of that 1.2 trillion that is le earning less than interest and there are better things to do with your money and it's that, it's that financial illiteracy that so many Brits have that we don't, we don't enact it and actually invest responsibly and in a way that's uh, commensurate with our values. Um, Matthew. Thank you very much, James. <coughs> I'm Matthew Spencer, the director of Green Alliance, which is a think and act tank, uh, the main environment think tank in the UK. And my analysis, uh, or my answer to the question, is very similar to Julia's, but from a policy perspective rather than an investment perspective. Uh, but before I come to that, I think it might be use give, useful to give a sort of se a sense check of where we've got to in, in developing a green sector in the UK, because the answers to that question help explain why a new approach is needed to the next phase of investment and policy. Um, so I thought I'd use a traffic light system, um, and I uh, have been more um, uh, positive than many of my colleagues about the performance of the government on the low carbon agenda. I think we've made significant progress on renewable energy. We've now got a world-leading offshore wind industry. We've got 600,000 homes generating their own electricity from their roofs. I think we've also position ourselves beautifully in the low carbon vehicle sector. We're now a major force in the world in low carbon vehicle engineering. Um, 
But the, the story starts to unravel a little as you move to some of the other sectors. On recycling, it's an amber light. We've effectively plateaued in terms of our efforts um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. On green building, we've had some fantastic innovation and a very, very good early momentum on green building driven by the zero carbon homes and then zero carbon commercial buildings regulations. Unfortunately, we have got no further in defining what those standards should be or when they should apply. And so the momentum is running out in that sector, which is a great shame. Red light on energy efficiency, as many people have already said, uh, we've actually seen a massive decline in uh, activity in insulation. And I suspect that if Matthew was on the panel, he'd also give a red light for air pollution because of very, very poor enforcement. There is a little-known fourth category, which is that the lights are out. They are not working. And that's protection of the natural environment. After, um, uh, an, uh, after some early good statements in the Nature Environment White Paper, um, I'm afraid that the UK's performance on species protection, habitat protection, is, has been very, very poor. Uh, we now have 60% of species species in the UK in decline. Even though we've had 100 years of environmental protection policy, politics seems, seems to have stopped working for the natural environment. The reasons why some of those reds and ambers are not green, I think is very similar to the reasons why our industrial policy is not quite working yet. I, I would uh, agree with John's analysis that there's some very promising movement uh, uh, and, some, so, uh, and a promising new framework, but what's missing is a sense of direction. Industrial policy is about re um, restructuring the economy, but I don't think any of us are clear about what sort of restructuring our industrial policy is trying to achieve. Is it a north-south shift? Is it a shift from uh, services to manufacturing? Is it a shift to low carbon and resource resilient UK economy. None of the, those things are implied in some of the policy, but they're never explicit. And so as a result, the animal spirits of the investor are somewhat confused. And I think the overall, um, uh, my, my overall uh, judgment on the, on the government's performance is uh, I, I would sort of hold back from judging on whether it's been the greenest government ever and point out that every government should be the greenest government ever because we're on a journey which means that each one should be better than the last. I think it's definitely the most confused government on green that we've had for a long time. Um, confused because it's done some fantastic things on low carbon. We're spending a lot of money on it, but it's doing it by stealth and it's failing to deliver the industrial benefits that we should be getting from low carbon by not giving stability to the supply chain. Um, we've had a fantastic Nature and Environment white paper, um, but we've t uh, slowly extracted the teeth of the Nature Conservation Agency that we have, Natural England, which is there to enforce existing policy. Um, we had a very strong resource stewardship, resource security paper from government in its early days, um, but we now have a Department of um, environment, food and rural affairs, which has effectively stopped thinking about resources, stopped taking responsibility for innovation in resource policy. It's completely stopped doing commercial waste, as many of you will know. Um, so I think we've, we've, we've lost our... We haven't achieved the benefits we should have had from some good policy because of confusion. Now, I don't blame... Uh, I, I'm not interested in who's to blame for that. I think what's happening is something more profound than um, lack of strong leadership from our politicians. I think we're entering a period of profound instability for public policy. Um, I think business has played a really crucial role in uh, minimising that instability, and both the CBI and the TUC have been crucial to maintaining our low-carbon trajectory. Um, uh, it, business will continue to be important as an investor as a, and as an innovator. But I don't think we, I think we should resist the temptation of um, expecting heroic leadership to get us out of the mess we find ourselves in. I think the estrangement between the public and decision makers is now so profound that we can't rely on good politics to, to deliver policy stability. And I think we need to make a very concerted attempt, those of us in civil society and in business, to, re, to put the public back in public policy. Let's take infrastructure, which has come up repeatedly as, as the last 
sort of respectable area of state activism, uh, we're going to see a massive uh, infrastructure uh, investment program in the UK, both private and publicly funded. Um, there is a school of thought that says, if only we had a 25-year plan, uh, technically expert, that could foresee what we'll need for our economy, then everything will get better. I think we should have a longer-term plan, um, but I think that misses a crucial point, which is Parliament can no longer de deliver a 25-year plan because it can't deliver public consent for that infrastructure. And so I think we've got a job to get the public back in, both as um, a, a slightly unruly uh, set of views about what we want our infrastructure to deliver, uh, through participative and deliberative democracy methods when we're asking the question, what do we want to happen? But also as a beneficiary from the infrastructure, which links up to Julia's point. We have invested billions of pounds of public in, um, money in low-carbon infrastructure, particularly low-carbon energy. But the public should be given access to that in their savings, through their pensions, through ISAs. Uh, <coughs> they should be given it through private ISAs and crowdfunding platforms. They should be given it through the Green Investment Bank. There should be multiple ways in for the public to the green economy. And until we have that, I think it's going to be very hard to get back to greater stability in public policy. So my plea to business is um, uh, work with civil society partners to find new and innovative ways of doing that. Uh, I would absolutely concur with Julia's point that it's, a, it's also about giving the public a stake in some of the investments that you're making. And I think that's the route back to a healthier politics and to more stable policy. Fascinating vision and one that Germany and some other European countries are already along, along the road with. Uh, finally, on our panel, um, Nick Lyons uh, from Eminox. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, um, my name's Nick Lyons and I'm Managing Director of Eminox. Eminox designs and manufactures emission reduction devices. We've been in business now for 37 years and about the last 25 of those making emission reduction products. So that's been a very key part of our business. And we, as well as being a manufacturer, we're a medium-sized enterprise reliant on technology. And so I'm a great believer in my business of cooperation and alignment between organisations to try and bring together policy direction and that's why we have been an active member of the IC for, for many years now. Thinking about our business, it's subject to lots of fluctuations which are unhelpful and difficult to manage and that brings back two themes that were mentioned at the very outset which resonate very strongly with me. One is uncertainty and the other is inconsistency in terms of policy. So in terms of rebalancing the economy, I think I see a lot of strength in UK companies in our sector, so I'm very much in favour of getting collaboration and getting alignment around that, and I think it, it is a core strength that can be built on, but in order to support that growth and nurture the talent that we have, it's about consistency uh, and it's about removing uncertainty so that investment for the long term because we have our own product, we have a lot of R&D capabilities, and investing on those needs that bedrock of, of, those, of those two principles in place. A familiar call for uh, yeah, greater consistency and indeed stability across the core. We have uh, 20 minutes uh, before the coffee session for questions from the floor. Um, I will use the chair's prerogative if people don't feel the urge to stick their hands up. Um, so please do raise your hands as quickly as possible. Uh, the gentleman just here on the right. Rodney Turtle from Snyder Electric. Um, in my contact with government ministers, I've definitely come to the view that they've bought into the energy efficiency message or the ener energy efficiency as an approach to uh, perhaps solve the trilemma. I, I know John doesn't like the word. Um, but they say there's a problem with it. Um, if they appear in the Today programme, it's much easier to talk about a nuclear power station because it's a big ticket item, billions of dollars in, um, of pounds investment, etc., etc. Energy efficiency is a portfolio initiative, multiple small incremental improvements. How can we help our politicians sell the message about energy efficiency and what it can deliver? T totally obvious, obvious answer. So... I mean, guess what it is. Anybody want to guess what it is? Um, it isn't sexy, right? And it's not very visible. 
And that's the issue. I spent three years developing a rather beautiful vertical axis wind turbine that I sold to businesses across the UK for obscene amounts of money because they could put it on the cover of their CSR report. Did it work? Does energy efficiency work? Yes, it does. So if you can imagine, right, so let, let's take one big corporate who says, we are going to take our entire set of stores and we're going to put all of the energy efficiency measures in and it's going to cost us 50 million pounds to do that. But we're going to recognise savings and a payback of maybe six or seven years, depending if LEDs are in there. If they let all their customers put money in at the same time and earn a return, suddenly this is the first crowd-funded energy efficiency programme. And then what if that's allowable through your ISA? And what if the Green Investment Bank puts up 50% of the money at the same time? This is newspapers groundbreaking huge numbers of people putting in 50 quid a time. It doesn't matter if it's 50 quid. What matters is the number of people and the number of voters who can participate. So just as we're talking about businesses are motivated by cost, everyone's motivated by cost. There are five people who can afford to do the right thing and feel good about it and talk about dinner parties. The majority of the country, individuals and businesses, it has to make financial sense. And the reality is energy efficiency makes huge financial sense. And to the 5.5 million of us with 1.12 trillion, 4% is a really good return in the current climate, and that becomes six when you put it in ISIS. So I think the government should say that the Green Investment Bank will create a new £50 million pot for energy efficiency, and they will match everything the public wants to put in. Mm, fascinating idea. Uh, John, sorry, yeah, you, uh, from a business perspective, I mean, obviously, as you said, the cost curve was done by McKinsey a long time ago. It's obvious what we should do. Many businesses still not doing it. How, why not, and how do we get over that barrier? It's a bit like your eight-page briefing on health and safety, isn't it? When you're talking about things that we all know we should do, but the benefits are micro and they're in penny packets and they're all over the business, it isn't that big strategic thing. And we all fall back to the selling the nuclear power station. I mean, I've sold all of CBI's work on infrastructure in the last month by talking about building a tunnel under Stonehenge. I am going to get my tunnel under Stonehenge tomorrow. It's going to happen. They might even call it the Quiddlen Tunnel, but that might be a bit pompous. <laughs> I've been going on about it till I bored George Osborne into submission. But it wasn't the tunnel that was the only thing I wanted. I wanted the duelling of the A303 right down to Exeter, and I wanted similarly environmentally sensitive infrastructure development all over the country. But you have to have some point of symbolism. On this issue, if I can come to the consumer side, the, the household consumer side rather than the business consumer side. I think the fatal mistake that we keep repeating is to fail to think about the customer journey. What Julia's just been doing is one example of the customer journey. This ISA thing is incredibly powerful. But, you know, look at the performance of the Green Deal as against the potential of the Green Deal. We made it hard. Like Matthew, I'm not in a blame culture. I know why it happened. I know why the Treasury got obsessed by rates of return on interest payments. But it killed it because it wasn't an initiative which any of us knocking on the door of a household could sell. Yet we need to sell it. We need to resuscitate it because it's a fabulous concept. But put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and make that consumer experience easy. And I've learned more about that this morning from what Julia said than I have all week. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, I, d I don't actually think the problem is public communication. I think the problem is aggregation. You're absolutely right. Politicians are terrified by the idea that they will announce an initiative and nothing will happen. And on energy efficiency, uh, well, as, as we saw on Green Deal, <laughs> um, and, on energy, and I think the answer is the market. Uh, in this case, um, the the business sector, when given the right incentives to aggregate lots of these small penny packet schemes, will do it and will make it so much simpler, whether it's street by street or type of house by type of house, And which is why we've championed the idea of megawatts and the idea of a, a market for um, uh, electricity demand reduction, as opposed to heat demand reduction, which we, we know and understand very well. Electricity demand reduction is something for which there is a market in, the, in many US states. It works very well. It's led to lots of capacity not being supply side generation capacity not being needed. And it does the hard work of bringing together lots of very small schemes. And the public don't need to know, they don't need to have energy efficiency sold to them by politicians. They just need to have someone turn up at their house who they trust or they've heard from a neighbor 
has got an effective offer, and they have an incentive in turn to do some simple things like swapping old appliances for AAA appliances or changing lighting ahead of, ahead of the normal replacement cycle. Um, and, and I think uh, um, a market for negawatts in the UK would uh, take us a lot further along. I'm Mike Gailey. I used to work for Eminox, so you'll see where I'm coming from, and I won't ex expect Nick to answer this question. But we've heard a lot about sort of decarbonisation of the economy. Uh, uh, and for, for the UK economy to be vibrant, we need infrastructure, we need transport, all of the you know, traditional things, forgive me. We, we're still going to need lorries running up and down our motorways. We're going to need green construction. We hear a lot about green in terms of low carbon. But I'm equally concerned about green in terms of public health concerns. Mm. You know, in the introductory remarks, Matthew said about the uh, em emissions. And I'm talking about particulate matter. I'm talking about hydrocarbons. I'm talking about NO2 from construction in our cities, which is a major concern to many people. And what concerns me is that there is no joined up thinking between DFT, DEFRA, uh, and health, and DEC about how we should tackle that uh, crucial thing of decarbonizing, big pun, of, of depolluting our construction industries. And I wondered if the major organizations towards that end of the table have got a view on how to reduce emissions from transport and construction. Hmm. And, uh, and the EU is pushing us to do it as well. There are fines looming. Uh, Paul, maybe, is this an issue the TEC has looked at? Well, I, I mean, I'll take, take sort of broader issue. I mean, I think one of the, the interesting sort of slides that, that Matthew's shown us before is where, where the environment figures in terms of public opinion. And, and partly, the, I think, the reason it, it, it's, it's so low down or, or perceived to be so low down people's agenda is that it's quite a nebulous sort of concept and people don't connect it to their everyday lived experience and, and their everyday lives. And so I think from, from our perspective, it's in, important to talk about the environment through the prism of, for example, the quality of employment, uh, the quality of housing, the quality, just the quality of life, and the issues that you raised around particulates, because you know, people might, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll give one one example. I mean, I, I think it's hard to talk about a sustainable economy when you talk about unsustainable, what I would consider to be unsustainable types of, of employment. I, I was recently in Nottingham, uh, looking at the work that's been done on the extension of the tram system. There, really good project, PFI project, uh, lots of public interest and involvement. Uh, in that project, good working relationship between uh, the unions and the main contractors on a whole range of issues. But speaking to a couple of the lads working on the project, they've been there two and a half years on temporary contracts, employed through um, umbrella companies, paying not only their em employee national insurance but their employer's national insurance contribution uh, as well. And so I think about, you know, it, 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 people are concerned about those issues, about the quality of, of employment. I would link that into to the environmental agenda. So it, it's how we communicate those issues, I think. Matthew, I know a lot of your work now on connecting with the public. There is a, an extent to which public health, and it relates to the energy efficiency question as well, public health is kind of, we haven't taken advantage of that enough as a green economy movement because the green technologies solve those problems too. I think that's right. I think, I, I think we've missed an opportunity to push harder and faster. And I think a number of us um, mistakenly assumed, much as we did with nature conservation policy, that once we had the policy, delivery would flow. <laughs> uh, and, and it hasn't. Uh, and clearly, there are a number of people now re-looking at air pollution. We've seen the Labour Party make it a major part of their DEFRA offer, really, is to, is to, to um, strengthen government's response to air pollution if they do form a government. Um, and I think we'll see that happening across all the parties and in the environment community. Philip Salomon from Quidos for an energy assessor accreditation scheme. Um, given that the panel agree that there's a red light on energy efficiency, and there are a lot of incentives currently, the carrots are out there, feed-in tariffs, renewable heat incentive, eco, home improvement fund, etc., etc. Where's the stick? And if the stick is to be rising energy prices alone, which the foreign-owned energy suppliers will dictate, is the government perhaps guilty of putting its energy security policy in the hands that it can't control? It is real shame about the Green Deal from a consumer point of view. I mean, I think people um, my age um, are old enough, unfortunately, to remember, to think of waste as a bad thing. You know, so we, when I was young, we saved our money up. And when we went to school, we didn't have Tupperware to put our sandwiches in. Why would you buy something just to put your sandwiches in? You get your flora tub that's just finished, and you put your sandwiches in that with an elastic band around it, sort of normal. It's literally one generation that has gone so far to the extreme of 
you know, getting it now and pay it back later. So, so waste, you know, for, for those of us who are 40 and and in that zone, we, we are at a stage in life that we have earned probably the highest salary we're ever going to, and it's all going downhill from here. Um, and we're in a position where we're politically engaged, and, and there's a real opportunity to get us to influence and do things. And a lot of us are homeowners, unlike the rest. So um, I guess we had a conversation with Barker at the time um, about the three asks, which were a green ISO, which we've got, um, some EIS treatment which you've got come through and the third thing was his would you crowdfund the Green Deal and I think the point is you have five clicks to get anybody from start to finish a normal consumer sixth click and they've gone they've given up it's too hard they're not playing if there was a way that we could even show people people aren't even aware that there are these incentives in place so I think there is a communications requirement about people understanding what they can do and I think that a lot of us have to start with a change at home with one single move we can take I think businesses maybe go we'll just change the LED lights which is a bit of a bugger for the next ride when you take that out of the economics but never mind but for consumers in general I think our generation, who are the homeowners who potentially have a little bit of the money, get it. But they just need to know that there's an incentive in place to do it and that they can get it done when they sit down with a cup of tea in a one-hour process and get that visit booked in and coming through. What's your view in terms of the quality of the assessors? And well, the, the assessors, are obviously, I'm biased, but they're very good quality. And uh, the reports they do are, are fantastic. There's, there's low compliance. There's only 40% in the domestic sector and 30% in the, in the non-domestic sector. But I, I really think we need a stick. I think mm. there needs to be something to engage with consumers and businesses to actually take action. What about energy ratings for homes? Did that just go away, this idea that your house would be unsellable in 10 years if it got a C rating? It's, um, it's picked up recently, and, and the one thing that we've always attracted is the number of complaints we receive. And at the start, you know, five, six, seven years ago, there were no complaints. Now we're getting a lot of complaints because homeowners are concerned about the ratings. We've seen a big pickup in the Green Deal in literally the last two, two months because landlords are realising that the Green Deal is an opportunity to improve their asset with no detriment to themselves. So that's starting to pick up, and the Green Deal is starting to become a little We're bit a nation of property lovers, right? So I think if you can connect the stamp duty to the, the performance of the house, that might be an interesting area. John, you want to come in just very quickly? Yeah, let me be controversial. I'm not a great fan of big sticks. Uh, I don't think people should be forced to do things unless it's absolutely essential. I think if you get the market right and you incentivize people, you create a, a movement and you mobilize commitment. Now, clearly, we're a long way from that. But if we haven't got these schemes right, so where would I put the full stop? Where would I stop things just slipping away? We've got all the way through this session this morning, and I think this is the first time anybody's referred to smart regulation. I think smart regulation has a critical role in the environmental debate. I spend a lot of my time in CBI in employment issues, a good dialogue with the TUC, arguing against inappropriate regulation. But I've always said that smart regulation that sets a long-term level of innovation for the sector that then allows companies to innovate is the right way to drive the market. So I'm essentially a market person, and I'm very resistant to householders, never mind businesses, being told they have to do things or else, because that's like a conscription army, and I believe in a volunteer army. But I do accept your point. There has to be a way of stopping this never happening. And I think smart regulation helps my entrepreneurs innovate and find ever better products that then you can sell. As someone who's uh, let property, well, not let, uh, lived in let properties for 10 years in London, I think the private <coughs> rental sector is a key area as well. I mean, some, you know, this great city has housing that's a disgrace that's being let out to people, and I think that's a natural area where we could very quickly improve. Matthew, sorry. Well, uh, you've just illustrated something I was going to say, really, which is um, I, I would go for long, loud legal regulation, but not un underestimate the difficulty of regulating when it affects people's lives. You have to build a, a permission to regulate. And I think in the private rent sector, we have that permission because most um, rentees are fairly fed up with their landlords or landladies and the quality of the service they get. So permission is not too hard to get there. I think in the homeowner sector, it is much harder to get. It will take a culture change strategy of the sort um, that we've just heard from Julia 
to have the permission at some point in the future to say you can't sell a house unless it's got to a certain EPC rating. And I think we're a long way away from that. Georgie Masson, National Head of Environment at Pinsett Masons. Um, one of the key barriers to the changes I think we probably all agree are needed, um, as eloquently explained by John, is the political risk and the inconsistency of policy. Um, how do you think you or we could influence the change that's needed there? Matthew, maybe Matthew and John, are, who deal with politicians daily on these topics, it's a, 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 any way of rebuilding the consensus that we had five years ago? I'm not as pessimistic as some about having lost common ground. I think there is still significant common ground, certainly between the three uh, parties who are currently thought to be the main parties. It may not be the case after May. Um, um, you know, there's, there's, there's agreement at the top of those parties about the direction of our, our low carbon trajectory. Um, and therefore, you can create a kind of Russian doll effect uh, where you have UK carbon budgets, EU 2030 package, and hopefully an international deal, which gives everyone comfort that they're not isolated, they're not they're not um, going out on a limb. And I think that is what's happening slowly and surely on the low carbon agenda. I think we've got a lot further to go on resource stewardship. Um, and business have been far and away the most vocal on this. Um, uh, uh, the environment community have not been particularly vocal with the notable exception of um, ourselves on the resource security agenda. Um, and I think government is... Uh, a long way away from having the, the tools to even understand how to assess resource risk. I think there isn't, I think we've lost a lot of institutions that helped government take an intelligent view of the future. You know, we have the Royal Commission on Environment and Pollution, we have the Sustainable Development Commission, we have the Natural Capital Committee, but it's only got another six months of life guaranteed. All of these institutions really do help um, politicians of all colours understand the challenges. Um, so I, I would say, you know, building, building, on the, on, building foundations where we have common ground, using institutions that are one step removed from government to advise and give a sense of what the risks are, and then making sure that the business and the civil society voice is clear about what the priorities are for any one particular political period. Paul, is the TUC concerned at all that political risk will undermine your work on this front? Well, absolutely. And, and the point I was going to make was that actually there's a value in, when we talk about coalition governments, but there's a value in coalitions much, much more broadly in the work that we've done, for example, on energy intensive industries where you bring together you know, key employers, trade unions, environment. I mean, I think there's, th there's a value in putting together what sometimes appear to be unlikely allies or unusual partners in, in, make it, in, in making cases... Uh, to government, and I think where we speak with sort of a, as far as possible one voice, although there might be you know nuances in terms of what our priorities are. Clearly, for us, you know there are issues around the workforce at the heart of all the work that we do, whether it's related to the to the green economy or not. But there's also we've got a very clear interest in having that you know policy certainty, which allows employers to invest, which allows them to create jobs that keeps our members in good quality uh, employment. So I would think about how do we put together sort of coalitions or, or partnerships of uh, you know, different organisations and different interests. So, I mean, I think one thing's come, very, uh, uh, come through very clearly this morning, morning is this point about certainty. Um, and that's something that you know, our members need, but it's something that the organisations that employ them need as well. So I think that, that sort of trying to identify coincidences of interest and where we can jointly lobby, I think, is really important. And as John made plain in his speech, business is very keen to be part of those coalitions. My some people said when the crisis came, this would drop down the agenda. It really genuinely hasn't. Well, it's very well connected with that question from Pinson Mason, actually. You've asked in, in the documentation, how do we get these kind of issues and what kind of issues should we get onto the political manifestos? And I don't think we can shift the 3% of the population that thinks the environment is interested at the moment. Um, so we need to go direct to the politicians. At uh, the CBI conference just a couple of weeks ago, the one issue that everybody talked about, we had all three party leaders, and they all spoke about infrastructure being a long-term argument, a long-term area where the politicians could start to work together. And within that, they put the energy policy, security, safety, and competitive for the UK. I think we have a really small window of time now where we get environment alongside that energy policy and we make them think about in terms of renewables and in terms of our industries and how can you do that and how can we help you do that? The survival guide for the CBI for the election has two buckets and neither have got holes in yet. 
and my two buckets are issues on which people are going to go into polling booths in the first Thursday in May 2015 and vote. And the second bucket are issues that won't <coughs> be in their mind. We need this debate in the second bucket. If this debate is in the second bucket, we stand a chance of getting long-term consistent policies. If any of the issues we're dealing with today fall in the first bucket, that people actually are going to exercise a democratic right on, let's not pretend that we can depoliticize it. So a chief executive said to me the other day, John, we'd be a lot better as a nation if we could depoliticize the National Health Service. I knew why he asked the question, but you'll never depoliticize the National Health Service. It's one of the reasons we vote in elections. I'm pretty confident in the way that you've just described that we can make sure that these issues today are in the second bucket. If the public aren't voting on them, then it's not controversial. I think those, those big infrastructure projects actually give us a real opportunity because there are different levers that we can, that the government uh, and, and others can, can, can pull. So I think if we're thinking about a project like uh, HS2, I mean, going back to the, the, the question that was put before, we, we want HS2 constructed, you know, TUC is a big supporter of HS2, but I mean, how you deliver HS2 is also going to be important. So you want to construct it in a way that's going to minimise the impact on the environment that's going to minimise uh, emissions. You want to construct it in a way that's going to have the most positive impact on the UK's manufacturing base and value through the supply chain. And you want to construct it in a way where it creates good quality, high quality employment and invest in the skills of young people coming through in the future. And so that, a project like HS2, and for that, I mean, whether it's Cridland Tunnel and the Stonehenge or whatever, but using those large-scale infrastructure projects to say this is the sort of behaviour that, and the, the frameworks that we want contractors to work to, to set a level playing field. No one upset uh, up front on a large-scale project like that, what the rules of the game are when you start is important. And there is good practical experience. I think, you know, the, uh, the delivery of the Olympic Games in 2012 was a good example of where those, those sorts of frameworks were used positively. I think people like investing in real things, they understand real things in bricks and mortars and bridges and things that they can see and that are tangible and that they use and where they can see there's a social value to it as well as anything else. So um, if we, I mean, I love the Scottish referendum. It's, you know, in my engaged experience, which admittedly is probably only the last 10 years or so, um, it's the most I've seen people get off their backsides and sit and talk about politics and therefore I think it's a wonderful thing in and of itself. Um, but these politicians need a very simple big idea, and I will say green ISA every day, right up to the thing, because it's the one idea that says democratic finance, people getting engaged in what they're doing, investing in real things, whether it's literally renewable projects or infrastructure built in a green way, we all get behind it and are part of it and have a vote. And I think they need a very simple big idea like a tunnel underneath which we can sweep the less sexy things we need to do at the same time. I'm sorry for saying less sexy and pointing. That was really <laughs> not that intense. <laughs> um, Matthew, Nick, any final points on how practically you... I think you're absolutely right. I think infrastructure is the big game in town. I would link it to the... Uh, the idea of greater democracy, greater involvement in decision making. I would disagree with John about dueling of the A303 completely. I think the evidence for, for uh, pouring tarmac resulting in economic growth is sketchy at best. But I'm, what I'm most, where I would agree is the need to have a debate about it and to give people as much access to the facts and the evidence and the choices available on infrastructure as possible before you set the plans. And then once you have a sense of the plans, you know, is high speed two connectivity in the north the most important thing or is it, is it something else on transport? And then I think you have to involve the cities and the county regions in helping create a local vision for what they want, a whole range of infrastructure to deliver. Because in the end, most of us can only think of, about the, the few square miles around where we live or work. We can't get a national vision which everyone would agree to. We can get county and city regions which together build up to a strategic national plan. But it has to have people in it. It has to have councillors. It has to have members of the public. It will sometimes be unruly. It won't mean there won't be disagreement. Um, and we'll continue to disagree about road building, I suspect. But I want to have a forum in which that takes place. And related to that is the key point that that 3% who see the environment as the top of their agenda, that might seem slightly depressingly low, but that doesn't mean that people don't care and aren't engaged every single day. And if you look at the polling on the engagement with a lot of the technologies that you, your companies are involved in, 
80% in favour of solar energy, 65% in favour of wind, huge numbers in favour of energy efficiency. Everyone loves their parks. Everyone wants to go outside and not choke on the air. So there are ways of getting the public engaged, even if they don't pick it at the very top of their list. It's not that they don't care uh, by any stretch. Um, excellent. Thank you, everyone, to the panel. Um, fascinating discussion, and thank you for the time. If everyone could thank them in the normal way.